And uh, I'm very interested to hear Susan's perspective on it because we're all in the one arena essentially in terms of, of news. And um, you know, uh, as you've been talking, Susan, uh, forgive me, but I was interrupted because there was a tweet from Mark Nichol in relation to um, the Sunday Times journalist mm -hmm. Mary Colvin reported dead, killed in Syria. So the first thing you do when you get it on Twitter and you get it on social media is you want to find is it verified, is it is it real? And um, so what you do, you go on to a traditional media site as they're called where you know that it has been verified, where you know they're not going to report you unless it's absolutely certain. And um, that's not taking away from Mark Nichols, who is a very trusted commentator. So when you hear he tweets something, or you see he tweets something, you know that probably it is going to be correct. But I think that's a very, you know, a real example of how social media can inform us. But reality is that it is the old fashioned news gathering that has been our important, um, and that, that we cannot in any way um, afford to lose or to devalue, uh, particularly in the current economic climate. Um, I had my tonsils out a month ago. It is not a pleasant operation. It is very nasty as an adult. Before I went in for surgery, I read a lot about it. Um, for those with stronger stomachs than me, you can look up YouTube, you can actually see the operation. But when I got to the hospital, um, I wanted an expert. I wanted to be in the hands of somebody who knew exactly what they were doing, somebody who was absolutely certain. I didn't want a citizen surgeon. Um, it amuses me that we're the only profession that's talking about citizen journalists as if they're a replacement for professional journalists. And um, you don't hear of citizen solicitors, you don't hear of citizen accountants, you don't hear of citizen surgeons. So while I think that social media and citizen journalism has an important contribution to make, it is not a replacement for what I would regard as professional news gathering. Um, in the current economic climate, it is very tempting for media organisations to generate free content in greater quantities than they have ever done so before. So citizen journalism, user-generated content, and social media are all being employed in this battle. And I think that's all the more reason to apply professional standards. It's great, as, as Susan showed us there, it's great to receive pictures of the flooding in Dublin, absolutely. And once you can verify that these are actual images, very important that you use them. But there was a Spanish newspaper that used pictures of the flooding in Dundrum in relation to a totally different story at a different point in time. So you've got to be very careful in, in the context in which you use images. Um, same, same in relation to Syria. Um, you know, we want to get um, images from, from people on the ground of what's happening. Absolutely, we want to get the heart of the story. Um, but we've also got to apply the old-fashioned standards of who are the individuals that are sending us the information, is the information from where they're saying it's from, um, and we've got to check it out in, in, in that way. I think that these are wonderful tools for journalists. But they don't replace verifiable, objective, agenda-free reporting. And regardless of the criticism of old-fashioned media in terms of where the agendas are, and I agree there are times that there are very clear agendas, um, that doesn't take away from the fact that it's an honourable profession that is striving to be objective. Um, and that's what our training is about, and that's certainly what I, in my role as editor of the Sunday Tribune, in my role as independent.ie now, would demand of the journalists that are working with us. They've got to be <coughs> stories that are object objective, they've got to be verified, and they've got to get both sides of the story. Um, it is very tempting for media organisations to employ young graduates, kids, for a fraction of the price it will cost you to get an experienced journalist, um, and then to upload material, you know, which is, is good in its own sense. My funny parrot, or my kid falling off a chair, or my drunken friend, and it's all very interesting. But it's not, it should not be replaced with real stories or real investigations. It's an add-on, and in this era, absolutely we want all the lights, bells, whistles, all the add-ons you can possibly get. Um, but, but not about quantity as opposed to quality. Um, I think we have a lot to learn from the processes of smaller news media organisations, speaking coming from a large organisation, from bloggers, from new ideas, from fresh approaches. Um, but it worries me sometimes that, that some of this, you know, that there isn't a hierarchy in content anymore, that it's all viewed as being um, you know, exactly the same, um, and you know, that it, it's of equal value. I think it is at times of equal value, but not always. Um, I think you know, the reality is, if we want to connect with audiences, we've got to use social media, and the numbers speak for themselves. Facebook is now ahead of Google in the United States. Social media is now the number one activity ahead of porn on the internet. Um, and even among, among the over 65s, the, the growth in social media is quite staggering. So we've got to know what's going on. We've got to be relevant to our audiences. Um, and there is a lot to learn, as I say. Um, sometimes social media is absolutely of, of, you know, the, the best value. I mean, I, I was alerted to the Osama bin Laden um, assassination from the Keith Urban tweet, and other people got it even before that. Um, so it does. It is. A, it is an important um, connection for us. I suppose is the way to, to put it. Um, in the old days, when I started in journalism, there was another bad recession on. It was the 1980s, and there were no jobs, um, and and we all were, were trying, as young people are nowadays, to get a foot in the door. 
Um, in those days, we had a forerunner to social media, actually. They were called tipsters. And they used to come into the office and tip you off about something. They didn't have access to mobile phones. There were no laptops. There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. There were no of those modern tools. But they came into the office. If the information was worthwhile, if it was something that you felt you could check out, if it was something that um, you know, was valuable to you, you had a thing called a blue dot. You remember those, John? They're long gone. Um, and the person <laughs> would exchange that for cash at the front office. Um, uh, but we always got that information in the active knowledge that it had to be written, it had to be checked, it had to be verified, um, you know, it had to also be um, grammatically correct, it had to be um, correct in terms of spelling, in terms of the construction of the story, a decent headline had to be put on it, there was punctuation, which I don't see sometimes on, on, on some of the social media sites I'm looking at. Um, and I think there's a real danger in the pressurised environment of today because these old rules won't apply anymore and that, you know, actually you can just take it and just shove it up online and that's grand. Um, and I don't think that's good enough. I think that back when there were daily deadlines in opposed to today's environment where, you know, even, even the deadline now is almost too slow. Um, we need news now. We need, we're incredibly pressurised to be the first ones to get it online. And that, to me, makes it even more important that we stick to the standards. And in the cacophony of noise that Susan is talking about, our credibility as a news organisation is extremely precious and it's very arduously gained and it's very easily lost by just succumbing to all of these pressures to get something up online immediately and to be the first every time. I'm not saying we shouldn't strive to be, I'm saying that it's got to be measured and it's got to be balanced with um, stories that we can absolutely stand over. I think dropping standards is a cheap short term solution and I think it is extremely, as I say, dangerous in the current climate, but it will destroy our businesses. Um, and ultimately what we're all striving for is to have a profitable business and that's what will ensure um, the continuation of journalism in the private sector. Um, I think that the quality of journalists required for the modern environment is far higher than when I came into the profession. Um, there's an expectation now that you're, you're connected in terms of social media, that, you're, um, that you can broadcast as well as write, um, that you can have you know, opinions that you want to put out on Twitter on a regular basis. Um, you've got to, I suppose, have a myriad of opinions, all very well researched, and all available at the drop of a hat, as well as doing your everyday job. Um, in relation to Twitter, which I'll mention particularly, I, I personally kind of have a love hate relationship with it. I follow a lot of people. I don't tweet myself. Um, I find I barely have time to you know, say hello to my own kids, let alone have an opinion on things that I can put out on Twitter on a regular basis. I do see the value of it. And um, that said, I don't think it's as valuable as it used to be. Um, I think that politicians and celebrities and sports people um, have recognise that uh, their words can be more powerful than they intend them to. I think they sanitise a lot of what they say. I think a lot of people use it to sell things um, or to promote things. I question when I see a celebrity, as I did last weekend, say that they'd had a wonderful meal in a wonderful restaurant in Dublin. You know, and I want to know, well, did they pay for it? I don't know. You know so I, I think that it's got to be taken, as I say, um, you know, in, in its context. Um, occasionally, you do get to know that it turns into a very good story, but I think a lot more is made of it than the reality um, that you get all these wonderful stories and it's the only way you're going to get stories in the modern environment. It's, it's one of a number of tools to get stories. And um, what I do think it is, is a good indicator, um, like Facebook is, or like the common system that we run on independent.ie, um, of what your readers or your users are interested in, um, of the subjects that are touching them, of the things that they're getting aerated about. You'll find in our top 10 that generally it's dominated by celebrity-based stories. But the reality is the stories that are most commented on are the economic stories, the political stories, um, Sport, um, you know, issues that are at the heart of our society, um, and we moderate it between two and a half thousand and three thousand comments a day online. This is another point in relation to social media. The liability we have in online is identical to the liability we have in print, so we have to um, moderate comments for libel, obviously, but for taste issues as well, because you know, taste can be as damaging to you um, if you publish something um, that is viewed as being in bad taste, and the next thing is you're looking on the line and you're defending it. Um, you know, so, so taste and libel is very important to us, and therefore we have a very, um, as, as safe as we can, um, a very well organised, well managed comment moderation system. Um, I think the other important thing to, to, to say is that I think that we will see more of a breakdown um, in terms of the roles within media organisations in the, in the coming months and the coming years. So I think the revolution is probably happening. A little slower than we thought, as, as James pointed out, over the last number of years, but happening now relatively quickly. I saw a core media report last week that said that by the end of next year, the expectation is that 25% of Irish adults would have a tablet, and that the potential readership there would be the combined readership of the Irish Times and the Irish Independent currently. 
So, so things are moving on in, in a fairly rapid fashion. I think the industry as a whole is seeking ways to monetize um, online journalism. Um, and until this happens, it's very difficult for any journalist to make a living out of writing for the internet in Ireland currently. Um, we're paying a fraction of what is being paid by traditional print media. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm saying traditional print media, and I hate that term. I, mean, I, I hate the notion of old media and new media. I think it's media now. There's an expectation by our readers or by our users that they're going to get stories, but they're also going to get video, it's going to be amplified, they're going to get audio, and they're going to have a way to connect with us. Their opinions are going to matter to us, so I think we've got to respond on all those levels. So, as I say, the notion that it's old media is that the consumer doesn't matter, and new media, the consumer absolutely matters. I think it's, it's, it's simply media now. It's about the future, and we've got to respond. Um, just going back to my medical analogy to, to finish up, um, I think that the journalism that's being practiced online is sort of the A and E of Irish journalism currently, yeah, and, and international journalism as well. Essentially, we fix up stories and we, say, we, you know, we originate them, we fix them up, and we send them out. It's not um, neurology, it's not oncology, it's not terribly specialised. It's about turning up stories <coughs> that you can verify in a relatively short period of time. And um, the vast majority of exclusives and investigations, the really good analysis, the really good comment, is still being paid for and being published in print media. Um, and I think this will only change when there's a viable financial model for online journalism. Um, I've gone ahead of myself here now. Um, I do think, I suppose, to, to conclude that the, the future is multi-platform. I think that it's exciting. I think to survive <coughs> and to thrive and to grow profitable media businesses, we have to be completely connected with our audiences, and we have to listen to them, and we have to enhance their experiences. Um, and that, that can mean audio, video, citizen journalism reports, provided it doesn't all replace what is you know, essentially the truth of the story. Um, I think we threaten our business if we replace agenda-setting journalism with personal agenda journalism. I think we've got to be very careful about that. Um, but I do believe that the future is bright if we can combine all the dynamism um, of what's happening online with the traditional values of credibility and trust that we've built up over a long period of time. Um, I think we need to tool up, but I think we shouldn't dumb down in the process.